Hello, everyone. Welcome. I'm Carol Hinkle, president of Triple E. I want to welcome you to this, our fourth lecture of the spring series. Just want to mention that this weekend you should be receiving an email looking for your feedback on our first four lectures. So if you would fill that out and email it back, that would be wonderful. The program committee really appreciates that. So now we're in for a treat. I would love to now introduce Beth Wood, our program chair, who's going to introduce our speaker. Beth? Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's a great pleasure to welcome back Ann Galloway, the founder and editor of VT Digger. If you were here for any of our previous talks with Anne at Triple E, you'll know that we have a very interesting hour in store for us. Earlier in her career, Anne was the Sunday editor of the Rutland Herald and the Times Argus in Barry Montpelier. And until 2008, when the recession hit, and like many organizations, they were forced to uh, eliminate some positions, including Anne's. And it was at that point that in 2009, Anne launched BT Digger as an online news outlet for the state of Vermont. At that point, the BT Digger had a one person staff of Anne with $16,000 a year to work with. And it has evolved into a $2 million a year, seven day a week news outlet with a staff of 25. Anne has been a finalist for three important national awards for ethics and innovation in journalism and for Digger's uh, investigation into the fraud at JP. And if you were here for Anne's previous talk on that topic, um, you'll remember the very challenging and significant role that Digger played in bringing to the fore the fraud at JP. Last fall, Digger won four national journalism awards, including one for its coverage of COVID-19. And Anne is here today to talk about how Digger evolved and adapted during the pandemic. And it's with great pleasure that we welcome Anne back to Triple E. Take it away, Anne. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Beth. Uh, it's, it's great to be with you all. Sorry, I was muted there for a second. Um, and uh, thank you for bearing with me. I, I do have a slide presentation, so um, I will uh, attempt to share my screen here. And I promise it's not too long. Um, so let me start this and there we go. Okay. Um, so again, I'm very pleased to be with you today. Um, VT Digger was founded in 2009, as Beth said, uh, when, when uh, I was laid off at the Rutland Herald and the Times Argus. And um, we're a little bit different from other news organizations. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about that. And then I'm going to talk about our, our COVID coverage during this very difficult time we're all in right now. Um, so VT Digger was started in 2009, as I mentioned previously, and um, at the time, newspapers were really struggling. Um, the Rutland Herald and the Times Argus had layoffs of about 20 people. Uh, the Burlington Free Press was also laying people off, and that um, problem has only intensified over the past uh, decade or so. So um, back in... Uh, 2009, um, I did a lot of research and really uh, homed in on a nonprofit model for online journalism, both because uh, I did not have a million dollars in my pocket uh, and because um, I thought that a nonprofit model would be a way for people to um, be a part of the news, both by understanding how we spent our money and also by um, enabling folks to contribute and being a part of it that way. Um, so I'm gonna go over some brief statistics around where we are um, with journalism at this juncture. Uh, nationwide, we have seen a loss of about 50% uh, of uh, the nation's journalists. And um, we continue to see more and more newspapers go out of business. And this year alone, we've seen another 60 newspapers go under. 
And um, as that's occurred, we've seen uh, more corruption in communities across the country. We've seen a disconnection uh, between people and their politicians and local government. Um, it's really, I think, had a huge impact on the vitality of our democracy and has resulted in more polarization. Um, and big tech is really the culprit here. And, you know, Google and Facebook have really eaten up a lot of the ad revenue. Um, back in the day, newspapers had tremendous profits. Uh, on average, newspapers made about 18% a year in profits, and that all disappeared with the advent of online journalism. And that's because um, Google and Facebook are able to sell ads uh, at a much lower rate based on the number of people who come to a website. And if you happen to be running a really small newspaper that has 3,000 or 5,000 readers, like a lot of dailies and weeklies in the state of Vermont, um, it's really hard uh, to make enough money uh, and compete with Facebook and Google. Uh, this is the uh, hockey stick uh, slide that I like to show that indicates how uh, the profits have shifted away from newspapers to um, Google and Facebook. And, you know, we're in an economy now that is largely an attention economy. So um, what you choose to look at online uh, is what succeeds. And so, you know, we are all now um, subject to information from a variety of different uh, places. And these are just a few examples. Um, one of the things that, you know, I think has been contributed, of course, to the demise of traditional newspapering in Vermont and nationally is this lack of trust uh, in reporting and also uh, new trends in social media in which people can make assertions that actually are false, um, that can be uh, interpreted as being true, uh, simply because they're being published on, on those platforms. And so that has kind of ironically drawn into question everything, including uh, the reporting that people do locally. Uh, most people now get their news from social media. These are old statistics, but it happens to be the most recent Pew Research Center report. And uh, my understanding is that young people get almost all of their news from social media. Uh, so this gives you a sense of what's happened over the past um, several decades. We've seen, like I said, a major decline in local uh, reporting and um, as it turns out, Digger now has the largest newsroom in Vermont, and we've become the newspaper of record. Um, that's not exactly where I thought we would uh, end up at this time. I thought that we would be continuing to compete with some of the other big dailies in the state, but um, those newspapers have really seen a huge decline in ad revenue and the resources that they've needed to do the reporting that really helps us feel connected as a state. Shockingly, um, the AP, the Burlington Free Press, and the Rutland Herald no longer cover the Vermont State House, uh, which is kind of amazing since all three of those organizations were uh, really instrumental in making sure Vermonters had all the information they needed about what lawmakers were up to and, and uh, the oversight function. Uh, of the legislature in general, in which, you know, basically representatives and senators hold uh, the executive in check. All of that reporting is now uh, done by BT Digger and to a certain extent by Seven Days and uh, Vermont Public Radio. So um, Digger is a little bit different from other news organizations in Vermont because first of all, we're, we're a nonprofit and we have a mission and our mission really is about public service and it's not about profits. It's really about making sure that Vermonters have the information that they need um, on a daily basis. And uh, this gives you a snapshot of what our daily reporting is like, where we are. We've expanded into the Northeast Kingdom, Burlington area and 
We now have two reporters in Southern Vermont, one who is uh, with Report for America, uh, which is a new program, it's sort of like Teach for America, um, but it's uh, about making sure that uh, recent college graduates have an opportunity to become part of reporting staffs at news organizations around the country. Um, from the beginning, we've been very focused on public policy. So that's why we have traditional beat reporting around business, criminal justice, education, politics, healthcare, and energy and environment. Um, we spent an awful lot of time on investigative reporting. And as Beth mentioned, um, our biggest story was the um, fraud at Jay Peak. And um, I'm still reporting on that in the background. Uh, we are suing the state for the third time over records. And um, I think that in the next couple of months, we may finally actually get to the bottom of the state's involvement uh, in this, what was the largest fraud in the state's history and the largest fraud in the EB-5 program nationally. Um, these are some recent investigations that we have done um, on top of our very intensive COVID coverage, which I'm going to talk about um, in more depth here in a minute. Um, but we had a big piece about the Slate Ridge Militia Training Center in West Paulette. And um, these were folks who have large caches of, of guns um, on the site and um, who have threatened the neighbors there. And uh, on the weekends, they blow up cars and things like that to protect, you know, basically to practice for some kind of action, which is not clear, um, you know, when or if this might happen. But uh, there were threats of actions at one point. Um, we were not able to trace anyone from Slate Ridge uh, to the January 6th uh, insurrection at the Capitol, but um, there were concerns that people from the uh, Green Mountain Militia and other groups might have been there. Um, this report that we did came out in October. The New York Times actually published a piece that was largely based on our reporting uh, just this week. Uh, we also had uh, a major piece a few weeks ago about Black women leaders across the state, as, well, largely in Southern Vermont, um, who have left positions of leadership because um, they've been threatened and discriminated against. And uh, this was a big summary report that helped people understand the depth of, of that problem. Um, you know, a lot of people ask me whether the nonprofit online news model is the way to go. And um, I absolutely do think that it is. Um, and that's, again, because of the way the business model has changed over time as a result of competition on the, on the web. Uh, we are now part of the American Journalism Project, which is a cohort of about a dozen news organizations across the country that are really trying to develop a sustainable model for journalism uh, in, in states and cities. Uh, so now the subject at hand, COVID-19. Um, we have really devoted a lot of resources to uh, coverage of the coronavirus. Um, every reporter on our staff was involved in the first few months in uh, making sure that we were covering every facet of the uh, impact of this um, virus on, on the state population. And so, as you know, um, we saw cases rise here very quickly in March and April, and the state really struggled uh, to stay on top of it. Um, I had some background conversations with state officials and begged the governor's office to um, hold more regular press conferences. And that's one of the reasons why we now have, uh, there, were, there were three press conferences a week, now there are two, but um, that was a result of um, pressure that uh, we put on the governor's office to get more information out more quickly. And I think, you know, they saw the wisdom in that and kept it going. And it's really been hugely beneficial to the state for all of us to know what's happening on a daily basis in terms of um, the number of cases in, in prisons, the number of cases in towns across the state. We pushed for that data, the town by town data. We also pushed for the hospitalization data, which was not forthcoming to begin with. Um, and then we've had um, many stories about the 
um, unfortunate um, deaths of individuals um, telling their personal stories, uh, both in the spring and again in the fall. Um, we have also kept very close tabs on access to everything from PPE uh, to um, contact tracing, to the um, efficacy of the vaccine, the new variants. Um, we've just really um, continued to crank out a lot of stories on this particular topic. And that's because this is all people wanna know about at this point. I mean, we are, um, 2020 was such an intense year for us uh, reporting wise because we not only were on overdrive with our COVID reporting, uh, we also were um, trying to pay attention to what was happening with the social justice movement. We had uh, three separate legislative sessions over the course of last year, um, an unprecedented one in the summer and then another one in the fall, plus the election. Uh, so it was just uh, an insane <laughs> year for reporting. And uh, this year hasn't let up either. It's It's been um, really quite a time. Um, and, you know, we uh, also have uh, new photographers on staff who have taken some stunning uh, images over the course of the past year about COVID and about a number of other issues that have come up. You know, it's just so amazing. We, um, as a state, we've changed so quickly. We've uh, somehow pivoted to mail-in balloting. Um, you know, we now have all these stand-up um, uh, vaccination sites around the state. We've worked with Walgreens and Kinney Drugs. Um, it's uh, the Scott administration and the legislature have really stepped up to make sure that Vermonters are uh, able to function at this very difficult time. Uh, we've also um, done a lot of work in terms of economic reporting. Um, you may have seen the issue with the 1099s. We were out ahead on that story along with stories about the unemployment rate, about restaurants that have gone out of business, about uh, the difficulties that the hospitality in industry have, have faced over this time. Uh, everything has changed and, and we've tried to tried our level best to keep up with it all. Um, we've also written a number of stories about uh, nursing home uh, conditions and about uh, the coronavirus sweeping through um, a number of nursing homes across the state. And um, really it's uh, just been such a tragic circumstance for so many people. Um, it's uh, because of our coronavirus coverage actually that our um, readership really skyrocketed last year. We went from uh, about 350,000 unique visitors a month to uh, 1.4 million uh, readers in March of last year, 1.2 million in April, about 1 million in May. And we knew that that readership would taper off a bit and we're now at about 800,000 unique visitors a month. Um, on average, we now have about 350,000 Vermonters coming to BT Digger every month. Um, the rest of the readership is from out of state. We've always had 50-50 uh, matchup there. Um, and uh, again, people were desperate for information. So um, we've tried to meet that, that need. Um, that has meant that um, our staff has been overwhelmed on every level. Uh, we have always from the beginning tried to make sure that uh, we respond personally to everyone who emails us, uh, for example. And um, because we have significantly more readers, um, it has become increasingly difficult for us to um, provide that kind of personal attention, which we really do like to, um, to be involved in. So um, we have instead, to meet that need, we have um, had a number of FAQ live events and we'll be having um, a number of events of this nature coming up in March. Uh, around uh, COVID and um, other issues. Uh, and um, so I hope you all can, can join us for those. We'll have Tracy Dolan, the uh, Deputy Commissioner of the Department of Health with us um, on uh, Wednesday, next Wednesday. Um, I also wanted to mention that we did uh, eliminate our comments section, which was quite controversial at the time. 
But the reason we did that was because it became a source of um, of fake news, essentially. Uh, people were publishing a lot of um, ill-advised statements or misstatements about uh, the vaccine, about how COVID is transmitted, about masks. And we felt that um, because of the uh, seriousness of this public health crisis, that it would be best to uh, make sure that we weren't allowing those kinds of comments to come through. And uh, so we did eliminate our comment section, which was you know, something we'd had in place uh, for more than a decade uh, before we made that change. So it was a, a huge decision for our team. Ultimately, we were glad that we did that. We did start a letter section, uh, which people uh, seem to like. And uh, it's amazing that when readers have an opportunity to reflect and actually write something uh, in isolation away from the bottom of a story, uh, suddenly um, the, the information uh, seems to be more coherent and uh, people actually make logical arguments as opposed to spouting off. Um, so this gives you a sense of our email subscriber uh, increases. This doesn't show um, the growth at the end of the year, but we're now at around um, 47,000 subscribers, which was a huge increase over the previous year. Um, we've also seen a big boost in, in membership, which is amazing. Um, readers really responded uh, in terms of supporting us because of the COVID coverage. And at the end of the year, we actually had um, about 10,000 members. Um, and this is about, uh, this is a short slide about um, our future plans. And this is the last slide, so don't worry, I won't be uh, boring you with more of, uh, of that. Um, but I wanted to let you know that we will be uh, starting on some pilot projects this summer. Uh, and it has to do with a community listening tour. We'll be really getting a sense of uh, what people need in terms of information in local communities, because we recognize that there are some places in Vermont that are becoming news deserts, and uh, we wanna do what we can to make sure that people have the information they need locally. Um, and uh, we also will be um, partnering with other nonprofits around the country. Uh, to help further um, the dialogue around uh, how to um, continue to make nonprofit news sustainable. Uh, and of course, we're going to be continuing our, our reporting on COVID and the uh, economic situation. We're in the middle of the legislative session right now. So we have a, a daily newsletter called The Final Reading in which we talk about everything that's moving in the state house um, day by day. Uh, and uh, we're also going to be uh, launching this Sunday, a series of stories about the coronavirus and how it's changed Vermont over the past year. So look for that. Uh, that's a day over day series. We have um, 16 stories uh, that we'll be um, publishing over a 10 day period along with podcasts and video and these FAQ live events that um, I'll be hosting. So uh, that's uh, really all I've got and I'm, I'm uh, ready to take your questions. So Anne, the questions are in the Q&A at the bottom, if you see that Q&A. Oh, yes. Yeah, and also there's some in the chats too. So you wanna click on those and then you can read the question. Oh, okay, sure, yeah, sure, yeah. absolutely. Um, yeah, so there's a question from Ben um, about the Pew Research uh, demographic study and uh, about where people obtain their news and uh, Pew Research is a big outfit in DC and they do independent studies every year about journalism. They tend to vary from year to year. And in 2016, uh, they took a hard look at social media. And at the time um, they found that uh, most Americans were getting their news either from Twitter or 
Facebook. Uh, my understanding is that um, uh, this this uh, trend has only increased. More and more uh, people are getting their news from social media. And in fact, uh, I, I've looked into the stats here in Vermont and about 168,000 people here are on Facebook. That's a huge percentage of, of the population. So it's uh, kind of amazing. I mean, if you look at the total number of people who are on Facebook worldwide, uh, we're talking about billions of people and uh, it's really larger than that community is really larger than any single country outside of um, uh, outside of China. So it's really kind of a phenomenal uh, situation. Um, I was going to mention um, that I don't know if you all saw the news out of Australia um, with regard to Facebook and Google, but the Australian government is basically requiring the two, the big two, uh, to pay for local news and uh, through what they're calling the news media bargaining code. And I don't know how much um, Google has agreed to pay. I think that's to be determined, but Facebook basically shut down all news posts for a whole day. And the outrage was so great um, that they reversed that um, in a few days later. So. Um, I think that we're going to see some trends globally around this. The European governments are also pushing uh, Google and Facebook to pay for local news because I think there's a general recognition by politicians that if people aren't able to get, um, if they're not able to get reliable news, um, that can have a huge impact on uh, the way governments function. So um, those are some encouraging trends. Um, uh, Judy wants to know about membership and subscription and what the difference is. Um, membership is uh, really a voluntary um, act. People become members when they donate um, to VT Digger. Uh, and they also can voluntarily subscribe to our newsletter, which is free. Uh, we have many newsletters actually, but, um, but we count our total um, number of subscribers across different products um, as that $47,000 uh, 47, number. Um, but uh, other newspapers, commercial newspapers um, sell subscriptions and that's uh, really the only way you can get the news um, on their websites. And we decided early on at Digger not to go that route. And that was because we wanted to make sure that uh, anyone who came to our site could get access to the news if they wanted to. And this voluntary approach actually um, has been uh, really important over time. It's enabled us to grow the number of people who come to our site. And we have been able to raise the funds we need to pay the professional journalists to do the work. So it's really worked out. It's, um, I tell people sometimes that's a little bit like, um, uh, going to church, you know, or, or making sure that the, lo the local church functions. People make donations and, and, um, and somehow, God willing, uh, people still are able to keep the lights on at the building and, and to pay the pastor. Well, it's a little bit like that at Digger. You know, there's a, we, we do our level best to put the news out there and uh, to do this as a public service. And we're very grateful when people recognize the value of that and contribute. So it really is um, a kind of voluntary um, exchange on, on the part of readers that we deeply uh, appreciate. And you can become a subscriber. Um, Annette wants to know how to become a, a subscriber. And you can do that simply by going to our website at the very bottom in the footer, that's what we call it, the footer, uh, which has that wood grain, um, uh, illustration at the bottom, um, you'll see on the far right hand side that there is a list of newsletters and all you have to do is click on the newsletter you want and put your email address in the little white box and hit send and uh, we'll, you'll be signed up for the newsletter that you wish to receive. We have the Daily Digger, we have a weekly wrap up, and then we have a number of targeted uh, emails around um, topics like healthcare and education and business and so on. And then if you want to find out what's happening in the legislature or you want our COVID email, which comes out twice a week, uh, you can sign up for those things too. 
Uh, Kathleen wants to know how community newspapers are doing. Um, well, um, my understanding is that community newspapers are really suffering at this point. Um, I have friends, a lot of friends in the industry and uh, local papers continue to shrink. You may have seen that the Stowe Reporter, for example, that news group, which also has news, the other paper and the, uh, the Shelburne News and so on, they um, ended up having to lay a number of people off and they are down to really a skeleton crew of folks who are actually on the ground reporting. Um, the Waterbury Record went out of business and has been replaced by the Waterbury Roundabout, which is Lisa Scalotti's project. Um, the St. Albans Messenger and um, the Essex Reporter, the Milton Independent, and um, oh, there's one other paper I'm forgetting. There, there are four papers in that group. Um, they're really suffering apparently and um, have had more layoffs. They've gone from uh, about a dozen people um, producing news in those um, towns uh, to just three or four people. So um, I think, you know, COVID has been difficult for a lot of newspapers. Um, while we have seen an influx in the number of readers, I think it's been more difficult for the newspapers that are attached to print and that are using the old model of advertising. Um, it just is a very difficult model now. Um, and uh, fund you know, raising the money is just increasingly difficult. Um, in our, at, at Digger, because we receive contributions as opposed to mandating subscriptions in which people have to pay in order to get access to the news, um, you know, we've seen growth um, because we aren't completely reliant on advertising. So it is, it is a difficult uh, situation for the local newspapers. Um, uh, Beth wants to, well, so we have some other questions. I think this is from, from Beth. Um, why are out of staters reading Digger? Well, that's a good question. Um, I like to say that uh, Vermont is sort of like Ireland. We have a lot of um, expatriates out there in the world who love the state. Um, they're either retirees or they're people who went to college here or they grew up here and left uh, to take jobs elsewhere. Um, we have a lot of people who want to move here. Uh, tourists want to uh, know what's happening with the ski industry and so on. Um, so there are a lot of reasons why people read us. Um, I also think that, you know, people wanted reliable information about COVID and um, my understanding from colleagues around the country, um, there aren't very many news organizations actually that are providing daily coverage of COVID in the same way we have. I was talking to a colleague in, um, in Providence, Rhode Island the other day who said that um, she has had a difficult time there finding out where to get tested where to get the vaccine. Um, there just is a dearth of information there about um, COVID. And so a lot of people are Googling um, for information about the coronavirus and they're landing on our site for uh, basic information um, about uh, the pandemic as well. Um, so could I explain about the Vermont Journalism Trust? Uh, the Vermont Journalism Trust is the nonprofit organization um, that uh, is the parent company of VT Digger. VT Digger is essentially uh, doing business as, as a DBA of the Vermont Journalism Trust. And um, the, the trust um, uh, really provides oversight. The um, board of 15 people now who um, uh, oversee Digger are involved in making sure that uh, we're doing all the things that will help us become, uh, stay and become uh, successful over time. So they're a governing board and um, uh, the staff is involved in, in managing uh, the day-to-day -day product and um, the finances and so on. Um, we, VT Digger merged with the Vermont Journalism Trust in 2011. A VT Digger prior to that um, had a 501c3 pass through situation with the online journalism project in New Haven uh, 
Connecticut, um, and we um, merged with the Vermont Journalism Trust, like I said, in 2011. Um, let's see, what are the biggest challenges Digger faces in the future? Oh, well, there's so many challenges. It's sort of hard to know where to start with that question. Um, we, uh, you know, we uh, are continuing to grow, which is uh, a good thing but it's also uh, difficult to manage growth. And we've grown very, very quickly. You know, we had um, half as many employees as we do now, um, just three or four years ago. Um, I anticipate that we will have about 30 employees by the end of the year. Um, we are building more capacity in our business office so that we can uh, raise more money through underwriting and uh, membership and grants and so on, so that we can hire more reporters and uh, more people on the desk to make sure that our, uh, our, our writing is ship shape and that our reporting is accurate. Uh, we are also uh, investing more in multimedia. We have more video and podcasts than we did in the past. So growth is always a difficult thing uh, to manage wisely. And um, so that's something that is exciting and challenging at the same time. I also think that we're faced with uh, some difficult choices in the near future around how to support local news. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, we have a Report for America uh, reporter in Rutland and Bennington counties. We're um, hiring a second Report for America reporter uh, who will help us in uh, Northern Chittenden County and Franklin County. And that person will start in June. Uh, we've not hired for that position yet, but we're in that process now. Um, and um, these regional reporters are very important as we try to make up the difference um, in uh, local reporting. Um, we don't want to bigfoot in and compete locally. So we're, we're trying to only run stories of statewide interest. So we have not um, tried to uh, compete on the hyper local level with uh, local newspapers because we want to do everything we can to support local reporting. But at the same time, we hear from people who are very um, uh, desperate for information about some of the bigger stories that aren't being covered. covered. And so an example of that actually is Slate Ridge. Um, that uh, situation um, required months of research and reporting and uh, the local papers didn't have the resources to take that particular project on. Uh, the same is true of um, an investigation that I published in September about Kern Hatton and allegations of sexual abuse at that independent um, school. Um, and, you know, there, these were allegations that had surfaced over time, over 60 years, actually, and it had never been covered before. Um, an attorney got involved in representing several of the individuals who have made the allegations, and I got in touch with the attorney and then interviewed uh, dozens of people who were impacted um, from the 1940s to the present. So um, those kinds of stories are uh, require time and uh, most local papers don't, um, are, aren't able to um, provide journalists with the time they need to pursue those kinds of in-depth projects. Um, what changes do you think journalism may realize post-pandemic? This is from Carol Hinkle. Um, you know, I think that there has been a recognition by the American public that uh, journalism is important and needs to be supported. And that's largely because of the pandemic. I, you know, beyond um, the election cycle, which was also very fraught and we've seen a lot of um, polarization around um, racial justice issues and around um, politics. Um, and so that can be uh, a difficult thing for journalism groups to navigate um, but beyond all that, people needed to understand the science. And I think most people understood that um, the pandemic uh, really raised um, the level of need around um, 
accurate information. And so post pandemic, I think there will be an opportunity for newspapers to again, um, prove their value by uh, focusing on the facts, focusing um, on information people really need. And, you know, I neglected to mention earlier that uh, as I was talking about the investigations that most of that work that we do at Digger comes uh, from tips. Uh, readers give us tips every day. They, they ask us questions every day, either through the tip form at the end of every story or direct, you know, our, every uh, reporter has their email address on the site. My cell phone number is on the site. I get calls and emails. Um, our editors get calls and emails. Uh, and then, you know, people can submit these questions and um, tips anonymously through our site. And what I want you to know is that we take those questions and those comments very, very seriously. And while we're overwhelmed, um, we do read every tip, we read every email, and we tr do our level best to try to um, address the questions and tips that people give us. And there's a reason for that. We're we believe in uh, making sure that we're reporting for the public, for readers. Um, we don't sit in an ivory tower somewhere and decide from on high what the news is going to be. Um, that's been uh, what traditional journalism has done uh, for decades. And that's not the way we approach our work. We see this as a public service and that's why um, we are responsive and we, I uh, want to take our cues from readers. And um, so I for had forgotten to mention that uh, in the talk, but I think that that is um, post pandemic. Uh, I hope that other news organizations take that same approach. I'm, I'm often asked to give talks um, to my cohort with AJP and with other journalists. And I always mention that because I do think that um, it's incredibly important for journalists to be responsive. Um, let's see, what are the biggest reasons Digger took off and has flourished? Well, um, I think that the reason that we've flourished is because we are meeting a need every day. Um, and um, I think I forgot to mention, I, I did say that we're a daily online newspaper, um, but I think that um, a lot of organizations of our size around the country are not daily operations. And um, I'm a kind of a journey woman. I believe in, in getting the job done. Um, and so breaking news is very important. And I, I've never turned my nose up at breaking news and our staff doesn't either. And, uh, you know, we are as interested in breaking news as we are in investigative pieces and public policy pieces. And uh, that's part of the reason why people come to us because they know they can get the news of the day uh, that we have become the newspaper of record uh, through dint of hard work. And, um, and, and we're going to continue to do that. Um, we took off really, um, you know, there, there were kind of periods of time in which we grew. And um, I think the 2016 uh, SEC announcement around JPEAK was really a watershed moment for us. Um, that put us on the map. Uh, we were picked up um, by a number of national publications prior to that. Uh, we were relatively no, unknown outside of the state. And uh, in state, we were more of a thought of as kind of like a state house reporting shop. Um, we've really gotten beyond that, both with um, the, uh, the notoriety we um, got as a result of the Jay Peak uh, investigation, but also uh, the COVID reporting has also bumped us up again. And I think that, um, again, it's really because um, we have been meeting this need. Um, and now someone else is asking about, uh, are many young people going into journalism? What is the outlook for the future of the profession? Well, this is a really great question because um, one of the other jobs that we're involved in uh, as an organization is really training the next generation of journalists. Um, we um, 
have found over time, I, you know, I showed you that slide uh, about the number of people who've left journalism who've been laid off, basically. Well, a lot of people don't uh, aren't attracted to a dying profession. Um, and so um, we found that there are fewer and fewer mid-career professionals um, who are available to take jobs at Digger. In fact, when we um, advertise for positions, especially reporting positions, uh, we tend to get uh, inquiries and resumes from young people uh, rather than uh, people in their 30s and 40s who have um, had an opportunity to work at other newspapers um, in the region. Um, and so for that reason, uh, VT Digger has become a little bit of a farm team. Uh, we have a very robust internship program in which uh, we are selecting people from around the country to work for us. And we provide them with mentorship and training. And um, we hope that they'll be able to take jobs elsewhere around the country. Many of the interns and young reporters that we've had on staff have gone on to work at um, the AP, um, at uh, other nonprofit journalism outfits around the country. Um, we have someone who's gone to the Boston Globe, uh, to VPR, and uh, Seven Days and so on. So um, we, we have a, a, a former intern who's now at the New York Times as an editor. So um, our people get around. Uh, and I'm really proud of the fact that we've had an opportunity to work with so many uh, great young people who have gone on to continue uh, to carry the torch for journalism uh, in other places. That's really important um, to the editing staff. Uh, Jim Welch um, runs the internship program for Digger and uh, he just does an incredible job of making sure that um, we tend to the, as we put it, the care and feeding um, of the young reporters. Um, the out, the, the uh, second question uh, was, well, I guess to go back to the uh, are many young people going into journalism, I guess the heartening thing is that when I go to conferences, I haven't been to man, many lately because of COVID, but um, in the past when I've gone to the investigative reporters and editors conference or the online news association conference, these are the two, two of the biggest uh, journalism conferences in the biz. Um, we have seen uh, many, many more young journalists um, going to the conferences. I think there's an idealism now around um, the connection between um, good reporting and a strong democracy that has uh, attracted thousands of young people to the profession. The question long-term is, are there going to be the jobs there uh, for young people as they uh, try to move up uh, in, in, in their careers. And um, that's kind of an unknown, um, but that's one of the reasons why, um, you know, I'm so happy that the American Journalism Project is looking to restore journalism around the country. They are uh, in the midst of um, working to raise at least $50 million to put into organizations like ours across the country. And um, ultimately their goal is to raise a billion dollars a year in philanthropy to support hundreds of news organizations across the country using the uh, nonprofit model. Um, and I do think that they're really onto something. Um, and I think that um, if we're able to figure this out in Vermont, uh, hopefully um, this will be something that can be used elsewhere. Um, well, I don't know if there are any other questions. I know I was talking a little bit fast there at the end, but. So, Anne, if you go back to the Q&A and scroll down, there are some more. Oh, there are? Oh, yes. Okay. Uh, let's see. Oh, uh, I know I'm looking at the chat. <laughs> okay, let's see. Um, let's see, there are a number of newsletters at VT Digger. How are they different? from the basic news site? Uh, that's a good question. So um, the newsletters are just a convenient way to be reminded uh, of the different uh, kinds of stories we have at Digger. 
Um, so of course, you can always look at the website if you want instead. I know sometimes people get tired of too many emails in their inboxes. I certainly feel that way myself since I get about 500 emails a day. Um, but I um, do think that the newsletters are helpful if you want to sort of have an archive, if you weren't able to go to the website one day and you wanna go back to it another day, uh, the newsletters are a convenient way to find uh, what you might've missed the day before. The thing is that we're producing so much news at Digger that if you're not checking the website twice a day, you might miss something. And if you're a news junkie, um, a, a, the email is, is a good way to keep up. So that's that's the main difference I see. Um, uh, um, I've noticed this, here's another question. I've noticed that Seven Days is now running full page cigarette ads in their print version. Do you have any kind of policy about advertising? I know finances have been difficult for newspapers. Boy, I did receive a note from a reader um, about this ad in seven days, and um, I am kind of surprised um, that they are running a cigarette ad, but um, uh, let me talk about advertising at Digger. I don't know what the policies are at seven days. Um, you know, uh, at, at Digger, we do take underwriting and um, we do have strict policies about um, keeping, the uh, sales operation very, very separate from the newsroom. So the newsroom never knows what's happening uh, with the sales. Uh, and we do have um, many advertisers who we write difficult stories about, uh, including uh, UVM Medical Center and Vermont Gas. And um, we still continue to get underwriting support from those organizations, even though uh, we have written stories that um, are investigative in nature or that are certainly unflattering. Um, we have turned down advertising. Uh, we have also, um, uh, last year we wrote a big story about First Light, um, about how they were using Huawei technology uh, and um, they pulled their um, contract with us. They pulled their $15,000 contract. So um, these sorts of things um, do happen. That's one of the reasons why I'm really um, pleased that we can rely on membership. Um, to me, that's a much more democratic way of supporting uh, news in general, because um, we, we don't want to be reliant on one big philanthropist or one big underwriter um, that's um, just a recipe ultimately for disaster. So the more people who can uh, support us, the better makes, uh, makes our finances stronger and um, enables us to keep going when a company like First Light pulls out. Oh, uh, another, um, a, a, another attendee asks, um, in recent years, have you perceived any changes in attitudes or behaviors toward journalists in Vermont? For example, accusations of fake news, demeaning language such as the failing of, an, of a news outlet, director implied threats, and so on. Do attitudes here seem to reflect the current divisiveness over political issues, elections, and the like? Uh, well, thank you for this question. Um, I, you know, Digger has been uh, subjected to a lot of um, uh, accusations of fake news. Um, that's a convenient way of saying we don't like what you're reporting. Um, I have received a lot of nasty grams uh, around the Kern Hatton reporting, for example. Um, people on Facebook often accuse us of. Uh, you know, taking a side. We did not take a side in that reporting. I, I bent over backwards to make sure that Kern Hatton had an opportunity to respond fully. The same was true of our reporting of Slate Ridge. I had a conversation with Daniel Bonnier, the uh, man who runs Slate Ridge. I also spoke with a member of the militia in White River Junction. We always want to make sure that everyone has an opportunity to speak. And so, um, the accusations of fake news um, are, are fake. <laughs> I mean, that isn't to say we're perfect, we make mistakes and we have run corrections and clarifications and so on, but um, we do our level best to get it right. Um, you know, Governor Shumlin uh, accused us of being like the National Enquirer when 
uh, we broke the stories about uh, Jay Peak, and uh, two years later, um, the Securities and Exchange Commission um, vindicated our reporting. So um, fake news is kind of in the eye of the beholder. So yes, it does have an impact on us because I think that when uh, people uh, question our integrity in that way, um, it can have an impact on other people who um, listen to um, listen to that. So you know when Peter Shumlin says, uh, you know, you're with the National Enquirer, that's a problem, you know, because he he has influence. Um, I've also noticed a trend, even with our current governor, in which uh, when we have raised critical issues, um, he will ask us if we've done the investigation, you know, why we haven't found, you know, if we, if we ask uh, the governor's office why they haven't moved ahead with something, uh, he'll throw it back at us and say, well, you know, you guys can figure this out. How come you haven't gotten to the bottom of it? Well, you know, we don't have subpoena power in case you hadn't noticed. So, you know, there's a limit to how much we can do um, as reporters. And so, you know, holding government officials to account is part of our job. It's not, uh, we're not trying to be mean. Uh, we do that work on behalf of the public to make sure that um, government is um, acting in, in the public interest. Uh, oh, someone wants to know um, if we keep track of how many times our stories are picked up by other papers. Uh, we're not very good about that. Um, we should be better about it. Uh, we get picked up um, a lot, I would say, um, you know, well, we have a distribution service with some local papers, so it's um, hundreds of times in a year. We don't get picked up by the New York Times every day, though, so that's why I mentioned it. Uh, that's probably maybe three or four times a year. Uh, statistics on readership county by county. By county. Our largest readership is in uh, Chittenden County, uh, followed by Central Vermont, um, and then uh, actually the largest uh, per capita readership is in uh, Lamoille County. Um, we have readers throughout the state um, and our readership numbers have grown in Southern Vermont too. Wherever we uh, invest uh, resources, we tend to see um, uh, an increase in readership and that only makes sense. If we're covering uh, a county closely, uh, more people pay attention and start to read us. Um, do we have an actual newsroom or do you reporters work from home? Right now, everybody's working from home, uh, but we do have uh, an office space and uh, we hope to be together again. Um, newspapering is, is, is a team sport. And um, so we have many, many Zoom calls. In fact, I have one at three o'clock uh, with the editors and uh, we make sure that we um, talk all the time with the reporters so that they have the support they need. Uh, someone wants to know what the ratio of subscribers versus frequent readers with no subscription might be. Whoa, that's a big question. I'm not sure I can answer that. Um, I think, uh, well, we have 47,000 subscribers and we have 800,000 unique readers per month. So let's see, on a daily basis, we have uh, about 50,000 readers. So I guess it depends on, I, I need to do that data research. I don't think I can answer the question. Um, how will we overcome the era of fake news? Oh boy, I don't know. I think everyone has to get off Facebook. That would be a start. <laughs> <laughs> this might be a good place to end, Dan. <laughs> okay. Good. I'm sorry I didn't get to all the questions. Oh, that's, that's great. great. We great. love having you. Come again soon. Stay <laughs> Thank well. Thank you. you. Thank you. Take care.